All right. Something in progress. Sometimes things are simple and sometimes they're not. Um, let me tell you, first of all, my, the basis for my ruling in this case. <clears throat> and I'm going to be quoting from the uh, State versus Rimmer, which is a 623 Southwest 3rd, 235. Tennessee Supreme Court from 2021, I think it was April of this year. The trial judge should declare a mistrial if it is a, if manifest necessity arises. And it quotes Arnold versus State. Manifest necessity occurs when no feasible alternative to halting the proceedings exists. And that quotes State versus Knight. The granting or denial of a mistrial is within the sound discretion of the trial court. <coughs> Excuse me quoting State v. McKinney and State v. Jones. This court will only disturb that decision if the trial court has abused its discretion, quoting State v. Atkins. In this case, uh, the defendant is charged with multiple crimes that the jury has been advised of and has been instructed about. Those include making a false report, clearly a crime of, a crime of dishonesty including the first degree murder charges. It's also including theft of property on two different counts and criminal impersonation of a law enforcement officer, all of which <clears throat> are crimes that essentially are uh, crimes of what you might call moral turpitude or dishonesty. While it is true that uh, I have bent over backwards in this case to try to ensure that the uh, evidence that goes to this jury and upon which they decide their case is free from any sort of prejudice that might arise as a result of some of the criminal activity that was going on, whether it be at the, uh, the motel in Kingston Springs where that occurred, um, or whether it be some drug transactions that were uh, proposed to be used as evidence in this case. Uh, the effort I've made has been to try to marshal the evidence in a way so that the jury would make its decision solely based upon uh, the facts of the case and not be weighted by some prejudice. It is my opinion that the defense in this case is, has acknowledged in its opening statement that Mr. Wiggins committed the crime of, of killing Officer Baker. It's just a question of whether or not there was premeditation and what the reasons were. The statement that has been introduced here, the defendant acknowledges it. He also makes statements in that um, which are verifiably false um, based upon the evidence that has been given to the uh, given to us and given to the jury in the form of that video of the body cam footage. <clears throat> based upon all of those, it is this court's discretion that simply the, a single reference to uh, some sort of a dope issue does not rise to the level that would require a mistrial and therefore this motion for a mistrial will be denied. I have prepared and asked the bailiff, if you will, Officer Howe, yes, if you will pass this to counsel. I have prepared an instruction that I'm going to give to the jurors. For the record, I'll read that. And then I will give it to the jury and I will mark it as a part of the record, this being my ruling on the issue. <laughs> My instruction will be as follows. This will be to the jury. As I've stated before at different times during the trial, I have ruled upon the admissibility of evidence. I again to reiterate, uh, you must not concern yourself with these rulings. My rulings, these instructions, or any other remarks which I have made do not indicate my opinion as to the facts or as to what your verdict should be when you go to deliberations. In prior hearings, I made rulings on the admissibility of certain statements of the investigators and by the defendant in the video you just watched. Redactions for this video were made by order of the court, and you may or may not have heard certain audio that was to be redacted that coincides with the transcript you were provided on page 85, lines 2 through 4. At this particular point in the transcript, with those three lines, I am instructing you to disregard the audio that was not transcribed, and you may not refer to it or use it in your deliberations in this case. I also instruct you that the video is the actual evidence being offered, with the exception of that portion, I'm instructing you to disregard, and the transcript is simply a tool to assist you in following along. That is my intention to give to the, that instruction to the jury, and uh, that will conclude the matter.
Your Honor, may I be heard briefly? I understand you're not ruling. I do want to make sure the record goes publicly. The line you're not ruling, I do want to renew the motion for mistrial. I understand the court's uh, ruling and respect the court's ruling. And the, the, uh, you do your job, counsel. I don't take it personally. It's decision to go forward with a, a curative instruction. Your Honor, it would be our position that based on the uh, timing of the statement, the nature of the statement, uh, that a curative instruction is insufficient and that based on that fact coming in before the jury at this juncture in the trial that it is, is, is affecting multiple constitutional rights guaranteed to the defense in this case. First would be the right to a fair trial. Um, the second would be the a right to present a complete defense at trial. Your Honor, we, we, we are flat-footed with that, with the juror having heard that, and and and, the, and even with Your Honor instructing them not to hear it. It'd be our position it's a bill that can't be on wrong. It has created a completely different perception uh, of the defendant uh, with this jury uh, that. You think what, it would give? A, I'm sorry. You're saying you think that that one statement would give the jury a completely different perspective of the ju of the defendant of the defendant and, and his purpose for being where he was, um, it essentially changes the dynamic from them ha having the evidence of being in front of them, of them being on the side of the road, whether he concedes other crimes, why he's out there for being out there with a gun for the purpose of dealing dope. Um, Your Honor, that's a significant, a significant fact, we believe, that works to, the, to prejudice the defense in this case. And there's also a multitude of other evidence that's in that statement that has to do with his addiction to drugs that has also equally been redacted. And it was redacted and that was a defense, that, you know, based on your honor's ruling, that was a defense decision. That, that should, all, none of that information was coming in and we did not even attempt to go into that. None of that's been attempted to be raised. We made a defense, a strategic defense decision based on your honor issue. Um, and this late in the game, it's impossible for us to switch tax um, and to try to account for the, the knowledge this jury will now have. Um, and lastly, and for that reason, it ultimately deprives him of his Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel in a capital case. Because we're, we no longer stand in a position to adequately defend the matter because we didn't have adequate notice that the matter would be before the jury. I do want to have the court consider the Tennessee Supreme Court's ruling in Blankenship versus State, which is 219 Tennessee 355, 1966 Tennessee Supreme Court. And it says, and I quote, the erroneous admission of evidence, if it may have operated to the prejudice or harm of the accused or deprived him of a substantial right or a fair trial necessitates a reversal of the conviction where the record shows nothing which can fairly be said to cure the effect of such error. Whether error in the admission of evidence is prejudicial is gauged by the substance of the evidence, its relation to the other evidence, and the peculiar facts and circumstances of the case. And whether such admission, admission is sufficient grounds for reversal depends on the facts in each case. And it goes down and it says, doubts as to whether the erroneous admission of evidence was prejudicial should be resolved in favor of the accused. Error in the reception of evidence is less likely to be regarded as harmless in a close case, Your Honor. That's an end quote. That case ended up ruling that absolutely that case was reversed because that improper evidence did come from the court. What was that citation court. again for? Blankenship versus State. 219 Tennessee 355 1966 Your Honor it'd be our position that unlike the situation in Rimmer this is more closely akin to what just happened and what makes this even more troubling Your Honor and, and, and prejudicial to Mr. Wiggins is the statement didn't come from an officer it can't be put off as the opinion of an officer who testified or of another witness it's coming it's a, it's a word they heard straight out of Mr. Wiggins' mouth, which again creates a question and ultimately, I believe, shifts the burden because it creates a statement from the, uh, from the defendant 
that now he ha we have to figure out as a defense how to, how to explain how why he's out there. So uh, I, I, while I respect your honor's ruling, I, I do want to renew the motion based on those grounds. Thank you. Certainly want to allow you to do your job. Uh, let me observe the following. Uh, I, don't, no, I don't need any argument from the state since I've already made my ruling, so I'm of the opinion that he was instructive to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court that they were to hear this case as to my reasoning. <clears throat> and as I indicated to uh, counsel, it seems to me that based on the number of charges against this defendant, um, with the type of charges they are, which involve the crime of dishonesty or moral turpitude, that it would be, uh, in my opinion, not prejudicial, unfairly prejudicial to this defendant for that evidence to be coming in, even by mistake, to the point where um, the, uh, even to the point where the court has to then instruct the jurors to disregard it. But if you recall back to the transcript and the redactions that we were making, uh, one of the issues I brought to the attention of both sides was that when I read through the transcript, I had some concerns about whether or not there was going to be a redaction of certain portions that neither side had requested. And those included the fact that Mr. Wiggins had outstanding warrants against him, that he testified he was on paper for up to 18 years. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that uh, he uh, had those charges against him that, that both sides agreed should come in, that he had outstanding warrants, that that was the reason he was gonna leave uh, Dixon County was because that Dixon County, or the authorities had shown up at his house to um, arrest him on the South Standing Warrants, and for that reason, he felt <clears throat> that he wanted to leave. It certainly was an issue that I expected it might be, but neither side raised it. I raised it for you, and it was still agreed that that evidence would come in. How can one mention of dope, uh, of a sale of dope, come in, uh, that would be, in my opinion, any, more, any worse than saying that he had 18 years in active warrants for a violation of probation outstanding against him uh, that, were, that was waiting on him to be served, and that was why he was thinking about leaving town. That seems to me to be far more prejudicial than any reference to some sort of a single dope sale. So <clears throat> that is my reasoning. That's the, the basis upon which I have made my decision. It is uh, the exercise of my discretion which the Supreme Court gives me. I understand, Mr. Evans, I have great respect for his uh, ability as a lawyer and his passion of representing his position, but I stand on the ruling that I have made that the mistrial should be denied. You gonna argue me out of that? <laughs> but I would like to be heard. Judge. I'm glad to let you be heard. Thank you. Uh, Judge, just for the record, uh, the state has gone through numerous redactions of both the transcript and the audio, two separate. One's a document, one's obviously a media recording. Also, for the record, during the playing of the transcript and the audio, I have two people from the DA's office, ADA Wyatt and Criminal Investigator Etheridge, both monitoring uh, the, the redactions and, and the recordings. It's just a glitch. Uh, it, it is a glitch. It was not intentional, and I don't think anybody's trying to say it was intentional. I don't think anyone says it was not, intentional. No, I just want to be on the record being heard saying that we have literally two people following it. I was following it as well. Uh, but <clears throat> in light of that, Your, uh, Your Honor, just to make sure, as we have come this far, there's not much time left in this recording. I want to go on the record asking that uh, with a jury out, that the defense and the state listen to the entirety of the of the audio with the jury out to make sure there are no additional requests for redactions. I have no problem with that. I think it's erring on the side of caution would be uh, appropriate. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and cue it up and play it. <clears throat> Is it possible to do it rather than an open court for you to do it in I guess we've got it queued up here, so I'm not going to leave it. I don't care, I'm just trying to use it. All right, let me just do this. I'm going to step off. I'm going to step back and just explain to the jury um, that it's going to be a few minutes longer than our recess was so that they don't wonder 
what I don't want to do is leave them hanging on the last thing that happened so that they understand that I'm going to bring them back in and uh, in a few minutes, but I'm taking care of something to begin with. How much more time is there on this report? Right at 30 minutes, Judge. 30 minutes? Okay. Here's my suggestion, because I don't want to leave that as the last thing and have them waiting another 30 minutes. I'd like to bring them in. I'm going to give them this instruction that I'm going to ask them to step out so that I make sure there's no other glitches. And that way, we've, I've given them a curative instruction before they sit back there wondering what's going on. So let's bring the jury in. No, this is not going to them. This is just going, to, that was just copies for them. And then the council, I'm going to let y'all, I'm not going to sit through it, I'm going to let you uh, review it, make sure both sides are in agreement there are no further problems before we resume. For planning purposes, if this is, we're looking then about another hour with 30 minutes for your review, this, and then 30 minutes more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to give you a specific instruction about something. So this will be a part of the, of the court's instructions to you in general. <clears throat> but I want you to listen carefully as I give you this instruction. As I've stated at different times during the trial, I have ruled upon the admissibility of evidence. And I again reiterate that you must not concern yourself with these rulings. My rulings and these instructions or any other remarks which I have made to you do not indicate my opinion as to the facts or as to what your verdict should be when you go to deliberations. In prior hearings, I have made rulings on the admissibility of certain statements of the investigators and by the defendant in the video you just watched. Redactions for this video were made by order of the court and you may or may not have heard certain audio that was not that was to be redacted that coincides with the transcript you were provided on page 85 lines 2 through 4. At this particular point in the transcript with those three lines I am instructing you to disregard the audio that was not transcribed and you may not refer to it or use it in your deliberations in this case. I also instruct you that the video is the actual evidence being offered with the exception of that portion I'm instructing you to disregard, and the transcript is simply a tool to assist you in following along. So those are my instructions regarding that. Now, because there was a glitch in that recording that I want to avoid, I'm requiring counsel for both sides to sit through the remainder of that and make sure that there's no other problems, but we're gonna have you go back to the jury room and wait for us to finish that review before we come back. So. Please, again, uh, keep in mind my instructions to disregard whatever the last uh, audio that you heard and let us uh, make sure that there are no further problems. Thank you. Court will stand in recess pending the uh, review of this remaining portion of the record. All right, please remember not to discuss the case or talk about it, including what I just said. Don't talk about that at all. We talk about the Olympics, but, but you can't watch. Oh, we can't watch. Just mark that as a part of the file. Yes, sir. The standard recess.